Greetings! Michelle Avon Vaughn here, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth and final episode of Undeniably Jamaican. Throughout this series, I hope one theme has come through, and that is no matter where you are in the world, no matter what people's preconceived notions that might be, you just stay 100% true to who you are, and you'll be alright. Anyway, for this episode, I traveled to Marlboro, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, and interviewed Graham Townsend. Graham Townsend is a Jamaican-born former NHL hockey player. He's also been named head coach of the Jamaica Olympic ice hockey team. That's right, we are coming for that hockey too. Anyway, sit back, relax, grab yourself a drink, and don't forget to add some of that tropical ice. Peace. Uh, well, my name is Graeme Townsend, um, originally from Kingston, Jamaica. I, my family moved to Toronto, Canada when I was about uh, three years old. You know, I, I have vague memories. I, I do remember, like, I do remember getting off the plane. It was an Air Canada flight, I believe. And I remember getting off the plane, and it was really cold. It was, I think we came to Canada in March, maybe mid to late March, and um, it was freezing for me, being from Jamaica. And I, I don't remember saying this, but my, my mom said all I had on was a thin sweater, because she didn't know, right? And, and, uh, and my mom tells me that I looked up to her and I said, Mom, I want to go back to Jamaica, because Canada's too cold. I was growing up in uh, Toronto, I think I was about five years old, and uh, there were some kids playing hockey, street hockey, outside. And, of course, the game intrigued me. The, you know, I wanted to have friends, and, and I was always a very outgoing kid, so I, didn't ever, I never had a, had a problem or any trouble making friends. So I went up and asked them if I could play, and, of course, they said, no, you have to have a hockey stick to play this game. Didn't have a hockey stick, so I went to my mom uh, later that day and asked if she'd go and buy me one, and we went actually to a drugstore, Shoppers Drug Mart in Canada, and uh, they were selling hockey sticks. I never forget it. They were 99 cents, a little wood stick. And uh, that's what I started playing with. It was a 99 cent wooden hockey stick. Well, the route I took to the NHL was, was you could say it was not quite common simply because my, the, my youth roots, the way I started the game, um, wasn't typical of, of how most kids get to the NHL. I was playing at the A level, and I struggled quite a bit. Um, my first few years. In fact, I may have scored one goal my first two or three years of playing hockey. I don't, even, I don't remember scoring that goal, so I'm just speculating that I had to have scored one. I couldn't have gone three whole years without scoring a goal, so I, I'm going to stick with that story. And so um, I, got, I eventually got better and better at the game, and one year I remember I had a very good season, um, and it built my confidence. And after that season, I, I went up to my coach and I asked him, um, what one would have to do to play NCAA hockey. We, I wanted to get a scholarship. I'd read about um, scholarships in a hockey magazine, and I was, I was amazed that they gave you scholarships to play hockey. I knew of, I knew of baseball and football and you know, that, that route, but I didn't know that you could get a scholarship for hockey. When I learned about that, I was 14 years old, and I set my sights on one of those. So my coach gave me some advice, told me wh what I had to do, to, uh, to get there, and I just followed his advice, literally to the letter, and I kept trying and trying and tried out for different teams. I'd, I got cut so many times from different teams, but I just kept trying and I uh, wouldn't stop. Um, even when a lot of people told me I should, um, I just kept going, and then finally I got to what they call the junior B level, and right after that, uh, three schools blew, ballooned up to 15. I had 15 offers, and um, so I chose to go to RPI, is Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, for a variety of reasons. One being, it was a great school. I wanted to, I wanted to have, a, I wanted my education to be solid. I didn't want to put all my eggs in the proverbial basket, as they say. So I decided I wanted to go to a really good school, and they also happen to have the number one program in the country, hockey-wise. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, so when I chose RPI, one of the reasons I chose the school is because they had a. Um, uh, a skating and skills coach, which at the time, which was 1984, 
I didn't even know what that was. It was there wasn't really any specialty coaches in hockey back then like there were in other sports. And a man named Paul Vincent, Mr. Vincent changed my life. Um, he's a man that took me under his wing, made me part of his family, trained me every summer. I would spend literally 300 hours a summer training under Mr. Vincent. He took a lot of time and, and put a lot of effort into me. And um, he's, he's the, one of the single most reasons why I, I, I developed as, a, as an athlete and as a person. He became like a father figure to me. And so I en ended up um, having a really good senior year. I, and I signed with the Boston Bruins at the end of that season and went on, on to my career. I didn't have a long NHL career, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I still look back with a lot of satisfaction because even if I just played one game, I feel that I, I beat the odds you know, and, 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 and proved people wrong. You know? and that was, that's what really drove me, people telling me I couldn't do something. Well, yeah, the way hockey was back in the late 80s and throughout the 90s, for the major, major part of the 90s, was you had players that filled different roles. These are your fourth line players, you're, you're the, you call them the glue of your team, these are the guys that are the character guys, and, 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 and at the time, back in those days, those guys were required to really protect their teammates. It was this psychology involved in hockey where it was a game of intimidation. And so, so that was the role that I was, I, I was placed in when I first started. And I would have to say that it, it was a role that I actually enjoyed my first year because it was, it was exciting, you know. I mean, getting into fights and stuff like that was fun. And, and it's crazy to say it was fun, but then after a while, for me, it, it wasn't something I wanted to be known for. I, I, you know, I didn't mind. The one thing I liked about hockey was, um, and I really like this part about hockey. Some, some people might not agree with me when I say this, but I like the fact that if you did something to me to try to hurt me or something that I didn't like, that I could beat you up if I wanted to, and all I got was a five-minute penalty, and I'm still in the game. I actually did like that. I liked the fact that I could get retribution for someone trying to hurt me purposely in a game, and that's when I, that's usually when I would fight somebody. Um, I didn't like the, the idea of just being that as my only role in the team, and so I'd say by my fifth year, I became really sour towards that role, and I no longer wanted to play that role. I kind of refused to. And that, that hurt my professional career. It hurt my NHL career for sure. But I was willing to make that decision because I wasn't happy being a, being a, a tough guy, as they say. So I ended up uh, having a, a good career. Ten years I played professionally and over five seasons, the first five years I played in the NHL. And I was in the, between the American League and the NHL for five years. And then I went on to play in the, in the minor pro level in, in Houston and, and started coaching as a player coach and went on to have a coaching career and still doing it to this day. And um, what happened was my son started playing hockey. And I took him to a session where there was a skating coach there, and, and the skating coach did a very good job. And I had this background in teaching skating from Mr. Vincent, so I, I knew what to look for and you know, what, what I expected. And then the guy did a great job, but then the next two sessions, he sent a couple of high school kids who didn't know anything about what they were doing. And I could tell the kids didn't know, and I was not happy because I was paying you know, good money for this. And so I, I went down and uh, told uh, the, the, my wife, I said, okay, listen, the next time I show up to this event, if I see those two kids and I don't see the main guy, then I'm going to go on the ice myself and teach my son. So the next session, and I, it's, it's, it's quite arrogant for me to think that way, but honestly, if I'm paying you money and I'm paying for, for person X and you give me Y and Z, I do have a problem with that. Um, I don't feel that this is like McDonald's, okay? I go to McDonald's in Atlanta, the Big, Big Mac's the same as it is in Boston. It's not that way with teaching. So I, I was unhappy about it. So I went on the ice the next session, and I taught the session myself. And uh, some of the parents saw what I was doing, and they liked, the way, they liked my teaching style. So one of the mothers asked me if I'd consider doing a hockey school, and I said, no, no way, I don't ever want to do a hockey school. And then the more I thought about it, I thought, okay, wait a second, my son has to attend hockey schools to get better. So why not do it myself, and that way I don't have to pay for it. We've had, in a short period of time, since 2008, we've had 17 Division I players, scholarship players. We've had two of our players have just signed NHL contracts. One is slated to be drafted in the fourth or fifth round this year. So we're getting really good results. These are just kids, that, the young kids that I started with, and they're you know, 13, 14 years old and worked their way up. And then, of course, you know, I've, I've worked with NHL players too, but... But these are the kids I'm actually most proud of because they're, they're kids that were like me. They were all told they, were, they weren't going to make it. You know, they were, they were, everyone was giving them the odds and the, the, the probability of them failing, and they didn't believe that. They, they believed that they could do it, and 
it's very gratifying to see them succeed. Right. Maximum effort out of every push. Harder. Push. Drive. Harder. Not hard enough. Not hard enough. Way too soft. Come on now. Push. Drive. Drive. That's it. Hard. Hard. Come on, Dennis. Harder, Dennis. Push. Harder, Dennis. Not hard enough. Come on. Drive. Hard. Get mad. Come on now. That's And I still have my love and passion for teaching hockey and whether it's uh, you know, a six-year-old beginner to a 26-year-old seasoned professional, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. I, I, love doing, I love working with both ages and everything in between. Okay, well, as far as building a Jamaican national hockey program, it's going to be very challenging. Um, like anything else that you try and start up, uh, the biggest challenge is raising funds. You have to have... Uh, money to make it work and we don't have it so our, our efforts now are everything we do is in, in, in an effort to um to raise awareness and then hopefully attract some very generous people that that, that have that share our vision and want to see something like this happen you know uh first of all this is going to be this will be history making we're, we're living history right now every day that we that we that we're in in this project um we are making history the fact that we became associate members of the IIHF is astounding to me. When they came back and told me they did that, I couldn't believe it. So someone over there believes in what we're doing, right? So now the next step as far as where we are, we're trying to raise awareness. We want uh, Jamaican expats and those down on the, on the island to understand that this is a, a huge opportunity for Jamaicans. Uh, we will build a, a youth hockey program in Jamaica. One, one story that has really inspired me, and it's funny how this just came up about a year after this project started. My sister sent me a, a link to this article in some uh, Manitoba. Uh, so Manitoba is a province of Canada. It was a newspaper or, or some sort of publication in Manitoba. There's a story about a, a couple who um, they were going down to Jamaica to help out at an orphanage to help you know, they're Christians and they were going down to help at this orphanage. And they, while they were on the orphanage's website, they saw a picture of a little boy that just something about his image made them fall in love with this kid. So they went down there and were surprised to actually see the little boy there. They didn't know that this kid actually really existed. And there he was. And, and he, they, 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 uh, the, the, from what I can remember in the story, the, um, I guess some little kid came up to the little boy and hit him in the back of the legs with a pipe. And, and the kid didn't, didn't even fight back. He was just so, um, so meek and mild. And they just, they wanted to take the kid home. So they, they started the adoption process. And a couple of years later, he arrived in Manitoba. And I, could, I don't know where they live in Manitoba. I'm, I'm suspecting it's somewhere north of, way north of Winnipeg, which is really cold. And I could just imagine what this little boy thought when at six years old, when he, when I, I thought Toronto was cold. When Manitoba was another 2,000 miles north, you know. So anyway, of course, um, his first Christmas, what did he get? A pair of skates, of course. You know, that's what you give a Canadian kid for the first, their first gift. You give him a pair of skates. And he started to just play hockey and became really good at it. And um, this article ended with him being drafted by the Kamloops Blazers of the Western Hockey League. And that is like being drafted by the Toronto Maple Leafs of junior hockey. I mean, it's a storied franchise. And they drafted Jerome, uh, Jermaine Lowen. I forget what round, but he ended up, uh, he's playing there now, and he's doing really well. And I, I, do, I do believe that uh, Jermaine is going to be drafted in, in the NHL, and you're, he will be the second Jamaican-born, mark my words, he will be the second Jamaican-born player to play in the National Hockey League, and he will have a much longer career than I had. He'll play hundreds of games, this kid. If you can find one Jermaine Lowen in Jamaica, how many... How many more can you find? Can you imagine? Can we find 20, 25, 30? No question. So can you imagine if we could get another 20 Jermaine Lowens, right? And train them properly and, and work with them and give them hope. And, 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 and the, 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 the desire is already there. That's the number one thing an athlete needs is tremendous desire. And you know that Jamaicans are full of passion and desire. And you put that kid on, those kids on ice... I'm, I'm serious. You're gonna have a, it will be a force to be reckoned with. And 
and the West Indian Canadians are producing a lot of hockey players. Uh, there's a lot of kids. It's, you know, everyone talks about the Subans, and that's a huge family, and they're, they're a hockey family. But there are so many kids that are playing this game of Caribbean descent, and, and, and that's where we're going to get our players. So we'll play in a tournament, hopefully in July, in Toronto, as we'll represent Team Jamaica in this tournament. And um, that's once people see a team, then it becomes more of a reality. And that's when we expect or hope that um, we'll start to see the financial support that we need so desperately to get this program going, really going. I remember when I was first asked to do this, I, I, before they got the words out of their mouth, I said yes. You know, because for me, I remember thinking as a player, man, you know, the only, only chance I'd ever have of playing in the Olympics is if Jamaica had a team. Because I knew I knew I wasn't, wasn't going to be invited to play for Team Canada or anything like that. So, so I, I, and I would have jumped at this opportunity in a heartbeat. If someone came to me when, during my playing days and said, listen, you want to play for Jamaica? It'd be yes, absolutely. Our goal is to try and have a team in the Olympics by 2022. That's a very ambitious goal, but that's probably the next Olympic Games that we have a chance of making. And there's a process you have to go through. Once you build a program and get approval by the IIHF, you have to start at the lowest level of competition, which I believe is, I want to say, Division Three. So we'd have to win that tournament and then get to, I think it's Division 2B and then 2A and then 1 something. And then finally, the championship division, which is the big boys, Canada, the United States. And you have to, I believe you have to finish uh, in the top 12 to qual in, in an Olympic year. So a year before the Olympics, that world championship tournament, you have to finish in the top 12 to be invited to the Olympic Games. So... If we build a rink and get a program started by 2017 and gain approval by then, we have a, a slight outside chance of getting to 2022. If we don't, then 2026 would be the next one. And that would, that would put me at around 61, but I'm still, you know, I'll keep in shape. I'll pump some iron and I'll be ready to go, you know. <laughs> you know we had a tryout last year and a great showing. And that was, that was done on a shoestring with very little advertising. And we had a lot of kids out there, about, I think about 40 players. Um, if we do more advertising, we may have too many, you know, which could be a good problem to have. But we're going to put that team on the ice, hopefully this summer, and then get the project really rolling. And then we need, we need support from, from our, from our uh, fellow Jamaicans. Believe in us. We're not just here to gain publicity and then, you know, take off into the sunset. We want, we have a very committed group of people here. They're very passionate. We um, want people to know that we're serious about this project. It's not, uh, we, we brought in uh, another big hitter, Jeff Brubaker, um, former Toronto Maple Leaf, former NHL player, former professional coach, very, uh, you know, strong, very good hockey man, well connected. And the fact that Jeff, it surprised me when he got involved because there's no money involved for, the, for any of us. We're, not, we're all doing this out of our own. Every time we travel somewhere, it's out of our own pockets. No one's, no one's paying for us. We all went to Jamaica. Heck, I mean, we had a guy that was um, a, a hockey rink expert. That's his job is to build rinks. He came down to, to Kingston on his own dime to inspect the facilities, to make sure it had proper airflow, air, air conditioning, and electrical supply and things like that. I mean, who does that? You know, I, I can't imagine how many, how many guys would, 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 would do that and um, didn't receive a dime from us. Everything was on his own dime. And he may not even get the job to build a rink, you know, but he wanted to be part of this. And um, that's who we have involved in this program, th that type of people, you know, who are all doing it because they, you know, because they love it and they want to see it happen. So if anyone, if, if there's one thing I want to say is that you've got a lot of people here that really want to get this, see this happen because, you know, out of love and and passion and we want to hopefully that that'll come through in this conversation that you'll see how passionate how much we really want we want to see this happen so um that would be basically be it basically be it uh, you know support us